So you had this thing today. I just I love it. This doom spending, right? Yeah. Where there's this no hope about the future. So spend everything right now. And at the 35 percent of Gen Z do, does that. 43 percent according to Credit Card, but 43 percent of millennials. So when I see this and the economic data comes out, Mike, it drives me crazy when everyone says the economy is strong, the American consumer is strong, household balance sheets are strong. This is a sign of depression. Absolutely. I think that is that was exactly the point of the tweet that I was making. Is that we're seeing behavior. That is predictable in the context of nihilism, right? If I can't, if, if I can't even bother to try to afford to buy a house, why am I trying to save the down payment? Why am I putting money aside? Let's live for today. So is Gen Z ruining the economy, either intentionally or just by accident, with their so-called shitty attitudes and thirst for revenge? As someone who studies both philosophy and social economics, I can't help but notice a fascinating contradiction between how social economics is practiced and how larger narratives about macroeconomic trends are shaped, particularly when it comes to economic behavior of Gen Z. So today I'll dive into some current trends and offer my take on what's really going on beneath the surface. Recently, there's been an emerging sense of moral judgment surrounding certain economic behavior. And perhaps it's always existed to some extent. However, it seems like today macroeconomic trends are more often than not discussed with an implied motive, especially since the pandemic. And one of the most prominent examples is the concept of revenge spending. Revenge spending refers to a pattern where after major events that disrupt consumption, like the COVID-19 pandemic, people accumulate savings due to reduced spending opportunities. Once that event passes, they tend to spend much more than they typically would, eager to make up for lost time. For example, in Shanghai, China, when the Hermes store reopened mid-April 2020 after months of lockdown, they saw record-breaking revenues reaching nearly 3 million US dollars on the first day alone. Louis Vuitton even reported a 50% surge in sales post-lockdown. The use of the term revenge here is interesting, I think, because the vengeful dimension of shopping is not immediately clear. <laughs> it's also interesting because there already exists another term for the same consumer behavior called pent-up demand. The term pent-up demand is exactly what it sounds like. We expect an increase in demand for certain services or products after a period of subdued spending. In other words, revenge spending is pent-up demand, but with an added dimension of negative emotion and intention to harm. So what is the term revenge actually referring to? The explanation that I found repeated most in American and general Western media was that the revenge is revenge on fate itself. People are upset that the universe has taken away their ability to travel and shop and hang out with friends, so they exact revenge on the universe by spending all their money. And I don't know about you, but this doesn't really sound quite right. The specific negative emotions seem misplaced for one. I at least experienced after the pandemic that people in general were less vengeful and more excited and happy to be let out finally to go see the world again similar to how there's generally a celebratory attitude after, I don't know, a big world war. Secondly, I think the use of the word revenge is strange because revenge typically involves a specific target and a sense of retribution. It implies that the spender is retaliating against something or someone, but what exactly is the object of this revenge? It's unclear because unlike typical acts of revenge where harm is directed towards a person or entity, spending money, whether on travel, shopping, or socializing, doesn't seem to have a concrete target for this supposed vengeance. The idea that people are exacting revenge on fate by spending all their money sounds poetic, but ultimately I think lacks substance. The pandemic, like many other large-scale crises, left people feeling powerless, and it is possible that some people interpreted the act of spending as reclaiming their autonomy. However, reclaiming lost time and freedom through spending doesn't exactly fit the concept of revenge, which involves both inflicting harm and satisfying desire for retribution. However, all this makes sense when you dig a bit deeper into the history of the term. The phrase didn't originate during the pandemic, as one might assume, but rather has its roots in China's post-cultural revolution economic resurgence in the 1980s. 
During that period, the Chinese government began to open up the economy after years of enforced austerity and control. And people who had been deprived of consumed goods and opportunities for years at this point, when restrictions were finally lifted, they went out and spent a lot of money, which was labeled as revenge consumption. And in this context, revenge had a very clear meaning. It was a way for people to push back against the deprivation and forced scarcity that they had experienced under strict governmental control. Their revenge was directed at austere conditions and lack of access to consumer goods. In this sense, it was clearly a revenge against the Chinese government or Chinese economy. And I feel like this new term has those connotations still. It seems like when these negatively loaded words are used about Gen Z's consumer behavior, it is to imply that people are on some level exacting revenge or rebelling against the economy itself by acting recklessly. Now, revenge spending has an inflationary effect, but it doesn't necessarily lead to any serious economic instability or anything like that, unless it goes overboard or turns into what is coined doom spending. So you had this thing today, I just, I love it, this doom spending, right? Yeah. Where there's this no hope about the future, so spend everything right now. And 35% uh, of Gen Z do, does that, 43% according to Credit Card, but 43% of millennials. So when I see this and economic data comes out, Mike, it drives me crazy when everyone says, the economy is strong, the American consumer is strong, household balance seats are strong. This is a sign of depression. Absolutely, I think that is that was exactly the point of the tweet that I was making, is that we're seeing behavior that is predictable in the context of nihilism, right? If I can't, if, if I can't even bother to try to afford to buy a house, why am I trying to save the down payment? Why am I putting money aside? Let's live for today. Doom spending implies a level of fatalism where people are spending out of a sense of hopelessness or resignation. Spending because they believe the future is grim, so they don't see any reason for saving up for it. It adds another layer of emotional complexity, suggesting that this behavior could be a reaction to broader societal or economic anxieties, especially among the younger generations. And this behavior has been linked to concerns about climate change, economic instability, or even personal economic precarity. And what I find fascinating is that there are essentially two ways that people interpret this behavior. First, as just poor financial literacy, or secondly, as some sort of protest. Now, anyone online will observe this trend and tell you the hard truth, right? Which any fucking idiot could say, which is that it is not a good idea to spend money that you don't have on superfluous items if you want to maintain a healthy personal finance. <laughs> Surprisingly, you shouldn't spend beyond your means, and you shouldn't have massive amounts of credit card debt. And the general attitude is that the people who do are on some level dumb or just very bad with money. As we see in this Fox News clip, the only reason for why they reason that this behavior is happening is a nihilistic attitude that young people possess. And if they could just grow a backbone like their parents' generation and suck it up, they could overcome the nihilism and start acting financially sound again, right? However, there's very little recognition of the fact that this, of course, isn't just an issue of financial education or poor attitudes, but rather a very specifically materialist one. The younger generation is not irrational for spending their money on dumb shit. They're well aware because they can see with their own two eyes that earning enough to ever be able to say, afford a home is something that probably won't happen, not unless a miracle occurs. And so they've clearly come to terms with that and are coping with it in the ways that are available to them. When older people ask me how young people are affording nice things that they wouldn't even buy for themselves, I tell them it's because we can't afford anything else. Home ownership or starting a family is so out of reach that we're using that down payment or kid money on whatever it is we can't afford that'll bring us a semblance of the kind of adulthood we were promised. When houses are a million dollar plus and an older couple will likely outbid us anyway, we're going to relinquish any lingering delusions about homeownership and instead use that money to give our dogs the most enriched puppyhood they can have. According to a Prosperity Index report by Intuit, rather than cutting expenses to boost savings, 73% of Gen Zers in the US said that they would rather have a better quality of life than extra money in the bank. 
And I think it's easy for commentators, especially in mainstream media, to focus on the moral failings or poor decision-making of individuals, portraying them as irresponsible or nihilistic. But this oversimplifies a much deeper systemic, systemic problem that's rooted in inequality, lack of economic mobility, and a society that prioritizes profits over well-being. Racking up retail credit card debt, of course, isn't good whether or not you can afford a house. But can it be considered irrational and unexpected? I don't think so, at least. I believe it's just as irrational as obesity is in our society. Because there's no lack of information out there about how to attain healthy finances and a healthy body. And yet we have prevailing issues of credit card debt and obesity. Of course we do because we've created systems that encourage people to both spend recklessly and eat recklessly. Perhaps not so much overtly, but nutritional food is ridiculously hard to come by <laughs> compared to shit food, and hyperconsumerism is encouraged through ever more present advertising in our daily lives, preying on that moment when you simply have no more self-control left to withstand the temptations put right in front of your face. And Nothing of this is coincidental. <laughs> this is also not the only way things have to be. There are a myriad of examples of countries that have incorporated laws and policies that actively try to combat public health issues like obesity, but other countries don't. In large part because it would come at the expense of the potential profits earned by companies who benefit by you being fat. You know, it's it's really the these wellness drugs or you know however we want to call them that are really prompting these changes and getting all these food companies very nervous um about what they're going to be selling and how they're going to have to reformulate they should In be fact, they should be been... nervous yeah they, they should, should be nervous they have no been they have been like drug dealers they have been making things that they know are garbage uh for us just like with public health, where some countries have taken steps to combat obesity by regulating food industries and promoting healthier lifestyles, there could be policies that address the underlying economic pressures driving behaviors like doom spending. This is the exact type of policy we're taught in social economics. But such reforms are often resisted because they threaten the profits of industries that thrive on consumer spending and debt accumulation. And this isn't to say that personal responsibility doesn't matter, but it's important to understand that individual choices are deeply shaped by the systems people live in. The fact that so many people are struggling with debt, just like so many struggle with obesity, I think speaks to systemic failures more than personal ones. The economy, much like the food system, is designed to keep people consuming, whether through ever-present advertising, easy access to credit, or the normalization of consumerism as a way to cope with stress and insecurity. But some people do listen to financial advice and take it, I guess, seriously. They've come to the awareness that buying new things doesn't make them feel much better, and they've turned instead to work against the societal norm by deliberately under-consuming. Underconsumption core is a TikTok trend that focuses on normalizing and romanticizing anti-consumerism, keeping items you've had forever that still work and potentially upcycling items rather than throwing them out and buying new things. Many creators have pointed out how this trend might risk just romanticizing essentially poverty because for many people, this of course isn't a trend to take part in, but rather just the reality of a life with less affordability. And I don't really think that that is a big issue and should be considered seriously. By that logic, anything that celebrates frugality would be offensive to poor people, but I don't think it is, and I don't think many people genuinely would be bothered by someone attempting to romanticize their lifestyle. The underconsumption core trend is a part of a whole series of recent pushes on social media to normalize not spending, such as loud budgeting and de-influencing. And I think it can be seen as a part of a larger economic trend amongst Gen Z, which has been coined revenge saving. Revenge saving has become a trend on Chinese social media as a reaction to revenge spending, where people are setting extreme budget targets in an attempt to save everything, if not most, of what they earn. 
They do this by eating at canteens reserved for elderly people, getting saving buddies online that help them stay on track, and by cutting out essentially all unnecessary spending. And you would think that these Chinese super savers would be hailed as the perfect individuals, right? After all, every patronizing American news anchor and every snarky financial advisor online would seemingly consider this the ideal way of doing it. These savers are following the advice of living within their means, avoiding debt, and prioritizing financial security. But no, yet again, we have a largely negative reaction to this trend as well. Because just as revenge and doom spending inflate the economy, revenge saving naturally deflates it. (laughs) Excessive saving can be detrimental from a macroeconomic perspective, again. So if a large number of people save rather than spend, demand will drop, which can stifle economic growth. So while saving money is good news for individual people, it's usually not so good news for the countries that they live in. In fact, China is one of the countries where households save the most. It alone accounted for 28% of the world's savings in 2023, which is almost as much as the United States and the European Union combined. China's leaders would, of course, like to see this money reinvested into the economy to boost growth. And this is where the revenge narrative starts to take even clearer shape. This revenge is indeed conceptualized as a generation's protest. And to be fair, for many millennials and Gen Zers, there's a palpable sense of betrayal. They were told that if they worked hard, saved, and played by the rules, they'd be able to achieve the same milestones that their parents did. Home ownership, financial security, a comfortable retirement. But as wages stagnate, housing costs soar, and job security becomes more precarious, many young people have come to the realization that the traditional path to success may not be available to them at all. This has led to various forms of economic revenge, where their behavior challenges or rejects societal norms, almost in a desperate attempt to regain control. And I sort of applaud this action. As a generation with very little wealth, you don't have as big of a say as the older generations do. So refusing to participate is perhaps the most available and powerful form of protest in that sense. Yet, There's a paradox there as well. (laughs) In a world where inflation erodes the value of cash savings, the most prudent financial decision is to invest, whether in stocks, real estate, or other assets that appreciate over time. But by investing, you are putting money back into the financial system, which is fueling the markets and ultimately contributing to the economic growth that supports the very structure that you're protesting against. So, In this way, there's no true escape from the system as it currently stands. Even those who try to live anti-consumerist lifestyles are still dependent on the broader economic structure for things like healthcare, housing, and retirement. The irony is that while young people may be protesting the systems, they're also bound by it in ways that make true rebellion almost impossible. In common with all the trends I've mentioned today is that they're happening with a backdrop of low affordability and poor future financial prospects. These factors could worsen both by inflation and deflation. But what is true is that the situation will likely not improve regardless, because this is a distribution and inequality issue, not simply one of an economic stability issue. What is ironic is that both revenge saving and spending pose a threat to the health of an economy and that both phenomenons of extremities are caused by the same issue, which is lack of affordability and prospects. So you would think by now people would have caught on to the reality that it doesn't help to moralize, shame, and accuse a generation of consumers of ruining an economy both because it doesn't address the real issues at play whatsoever, and also because, if anything, it serves as a driver of even more extreme behavior. Gen Z has nothing. (laughs) They overspend. They get shamed for overspending. They underspend, save every penny, and it's just a vicious cycle of frantic and reactionary behavior. It's an oversimplification, and quite frankly, I think a condescending one, to divide the world into two camps, the all-knowing global elite who are supposedly managing the systems, and the silly dumb plebs who are either ruining things by spending too much or saving too much. This framing misses, I think, the complexity of both individual agency and the systemic pressures that shape behavior. The reality is, 
much more nuanced. <laughs> Most people, regardless of their social or economic standing, are operating within the constraints of systems that they didn't design, often responding rationally to the pressures and incentives placed upon them. So when people engage in things like revenge spending or rent saving, they're not mindlessly trying to ruin the economy. They're reacting to their circumstances, often in ways that reflect their understanding of a system that feels rigged against them. And that could mean spending in the face of uncertainty, because what's the point in saving when long-term security seems unattainable? Or it can mean saving aggressively because the lack of trust in future economic stability. What's especially frustrating about this dichotomy is how it serves to obscure the real structural issues at play. It's convenient for certain commentators or even politicians to point the fingers at individuals, suggesting that consumer habits are the problem, rather than acknowledging that the economic system might need reform. It's a way to shift the conversation away from systemic ch change towards individual behavior, as if all we need is for people to budget better or spend more responsibly, and everything will be fine. And people jump right on it. Maybe that's just another function of the internet, but there's clearly no shortage of relatively well-off people out there eager to tell you how to stop being so stupid and poor. These people are so convinced, and not surprisingly so, after all, it's all we hear in the media, that the reason they've gotten where they are is because of their own personal exceptionalism, instead of privilege, systems that benefit them, and a healthy dose of luck. <laughs> the internet thrives on this kind of content because it's often presented as tough love or hard truth, which can go viral, I think, quite easily. People love sharing these no-nonsense takes because it reinforces the idea that success is entirely within an individual's control. If you just could budget better, work harder, or follow a few simple steps, you can escape poverty or financial insecurity. It's a classic pull yourself up by the bootstraps type of mentality, amplified by influencers and content creators who often lack a real understanding of economic systems. When economists and media pundits emphasize behavioral quirks like revenge spending, doom spending, or revenge saving, they frame these trends as if they were unforeseeable or irrational shifts in human nature. In reality, these behaviors are entirely rational responses to the broader economic landscape that has been shaped by years of policy decision, wealth distribution, and market forces. These trends don't arise spontaneously. They are the direct result of economic planning and policy that encourages certain behavior while discouraging others. For example, policies that prioritize market-driven growth over social safety nets incentivize people to either hoard money out of fear or overspend in response to economic insecurity. And this is where behavioral economics seems rather silly at times. It's like trying to fix a leaking roof by focusing on whether people tend to sit on the left or right side of the room, instead of addressing the fact that the entire house is about to flood. <laughs> Behavioral economics, while valuable in understanding the nuances of individual decision-making, often misses, I think, the bigger picture. The system itself is flawed. People's behavior, whether they are spending, saving, or under-consuming, are largely dictated by incentives and constraints imposed by the economic system. There's nothing new under the sun. Revenge spending isn't new. Doom spending isn't new. <laughs> Revenge saving isn't new. Human beings' general behavioral patterns don't fundamentally change from generation to generation. So these trends shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. What's surprising, or rather disappointing, is how often economists and the media seem to treat these behaviors as novel phenomena as if they emerged out of nowhere, instead of recognizing that they are the direct result of systemic issues that have been building for decades at this point. And this raises a deeper question. Why are we so focused on these individual level behaviors? Is it because economists don't learn enough history and human behavior? Or is it media sensationalism that frames these trends as dramatic and unexpected? I suspect that it's a bit of both. Economists often fall into the trap of over-relying on models that prioritize individual rationality without fully accounting for historical and structural forces. Meanwhile, the media narrative loves a good narrative, and framing these behaviors as bizarre or irrational trends creates a more compelling story than addressing the real, often quite boring, economic drivers behind them. But 
here's the real threat. By fixating on individual behavior and sensationalizing trends, we risk ignoring the needs for systemic change. The focus on behavioral quirks perpetualizes the myth that if people just acted differently, everything would be fine. This approach distracts from the fact that many of these behaviors are coping mechanisms in response to economic systems that fail to serve the majority of people. And if we continue down this path, we'll never be able to develop a better economic system. The problem isn't that people are behaving irrationally, it's that the system itself is irrational. And until we address the structural problems, like inequality, wage stagnation, and inadequate social safety nets, we're going to keep seeing the same patterns over and over again, repackaged as new trends that miss the forest for the trees.